Um, so thank you everyone for attending. Please uh, let me know if you can't hear me, I'll start speaking uh, louder. I'd like to thank AppFed for this venue to let us get together and uh, do this chat. Gillian and Julie for um, their technical help and all of you for um, taking the time this afternoon to get together for this webinar. My only disclosure here today is that this is my first webinar. I have not done this before. So hopefully all our technical glitches are behind us, but please let me know if uh, you can't hear me. And of course I have to get used to talking to myself here and talking to my computer. So um, we'll get started. What I'd like to try and do in the next half an hour and the informational portion of this program is to go over the definition of eosinophilic esophagitis, the clinical presentation and how patients, the symptoms that we see, epidemiology in terms of how common this is, what we think about regarding the pathophysiology of this condition and the causes, and review some treatment options. Can everyone still hear me okay? Great. So when we talk about the diagnostic criteria and how this has developed, we go back a little bit to 2007, and that was when the first consensus guidelines came to be. And at that point, there was a group of over 30 clinicians, a combination of adult and pediatric gastroenterologists, allergists, and pathologists, who all got together in a very systematic um, way at a Fagers convention, and we reviewed the literature, meaning all the available studies on eosinophilic esophagitis. And we reviewed this with a main goal of coming up with some consensus on how we should be diagnosing, managing, and treating this condition. And most recently, this was revised in 2011 and published in the Jackie. And it really was a multidisciplinary approach to helping better understand this disease. And what we came up with in terms of the diagnostic criteria is that EOE is a clinical pathologic disease. And what I mean by that is that there need to be a clinical component of this, for instance, symptoms that are compatible with dysfunction of the esophagus, such as difficulty swallowing, heartburn, chest pain, which are the common things in adults. And pathologically, meaning that esophageal biopsies need to show increased numbers of eosinophil or inflammatory cells in the esophagus. And we typically think about a number of 15 as being the diagnostic threshold or the cutoff for what we typically will diagnose um, EOE. Now this inflammation is typically isolated to the esophagus, meaning that the eosinophils are not in the stomach and the small intestine. And we've ruled out other causes for eosinophilia or eosinophils in the esophagus, and the most common being reflux disease. This condition is very patchy, meaning that it's not uniformly seen throughout the esophagus, and therefore multiple biopsies are needed, and we'll talk about that a little further. So overall, when we talk about the epidemiology or how common this is, we've really seen over the last several years that the prevalence of eosinophilic esophagitis has been rising in both adults and children. Here we see the bars and the numbers of new patients in adults in Olten County in Switzerland and new patients in children in Hamilton County in Ohio. And what's not debatable here is that these numbers are rising with a prevalence of EOE being 4.5 out of 10,000 adults and 10.4 out of 10,000 children. And those numbers in and of itself may not mean much, but what that means to us as gastroenterologists is that this is actually becoming a very common disease and more common than diseases that we typically think about, like inflammatory dis bowel disease, like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. The typical presentation that we see in adults, while it does affect women, it is a male predominant disease similar to children in a ratio of three to one. This presents 
most oftenly, most commonly in the third or fourth decade. And the majority of patients tend to have an atopic history. And what that means is they have other allergic disorders, such as asthma or allergic rhinitis or eczema in about 70 to 80 percent of cases. While this can affect any ethnicity, the most common um, ethnicity in, uh, um, affected is a Caucasian uh, predilection. We sometimes will see family members with eosinophilic esophagitis, either the parents or the children, and oftentimes there can be family members that also have these allergic uh, disorders, including food allergies. Again, the most common symptoms that we see in adults is dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, food impaction, meaning having food caught in the esophagus and not able to remove that food is seen anywhere from 33 to 54% of patients. We can also see heartburn, reflux, and chest pain, although this is not as common. Now this is different than what we typically see in children where the most common symptoms are reflux, emesis or vomiting, abdominal pain, and failure to thrive or difficulty growing. Um, it's not until children are older or in adolescence that they typically develop more of the adult what we call phenotype or presentation where they have difficulty swallowing and food impaction. Now the big question is, how do we diagnose eosinophilic esophagitis? Well, right now the gold standard is to do an upper endoscopy with biopsy of the esophagus. Now when we do an upper endoscopy, I just wanted to show you what we typically will see. And this is an endoscopic picture of a normal appearing esophagus. And what you see here is the esophagus is nice and pink and smooth. You'll see some blood vessels here in the esophagus, and that's all normal. This is what we would expect. In patients with eosinophilic esophagitis, however, they do have characteristic endoscopic features. And what we see here are the concentric rings that go around and down the length of the esophagus. And this can obviously cause difficulty swallowing. We can think of these as little uh, bumps or speed bumps in the esophagus. Linear furrowing, and by that I mean these little railroad tracks that go down the esophagus. White exudates or plaques, and those are the little white dots here that you can see along the length of the esophagus. And if we biopsy these areas here of those little white dots, we'll see that these are actually eosinophilic microabscesses. This last um, endoscopic picture here is a picture of one of our patients with a food impaction who came into the emergency room with chicken in his esophagus. And you can see here again the concentric mucosal rings, you can see a linear furrow, and there's some food caught in the esophagus that we needed to do a procedure to remove. So when we talk about doing an esophageal biopsy, um, what are we typically looking for? So what do we see on your slides and what, um, you know, when you read some of the reports, what are we referring to? So this is an example of a normal esophagus and a normal esophageal biopsy. And this is the luminal surface up here, and that means the center portion of the esophagus where the food goes down. And this is the deeper layer of the esophagus here. And what you can see is nicely ordered cells. Um, they're all nice and pink. Um, in the esophagus, and there are no red cells, which are typically the eosinophils. Now, this is in contrast to a patient with eosinophilic esophagitis. And here you can hopefully see, again, this is the luminal surface, meaning the surface where the food passes, and this is deeper as we go down into the esophagus. And our biopsies are very superficial. We do not take deep biopsies. Um, but anyway, what you'll see here is multiple of these um, red cells here, which are the eosinophils, and they're typically clustered along the top part of the biopsy specimen. If we look at a very a small portion of the biopsy in what it's called a high-powered field, that's where we get that number 15. There's at least 15 cells or eosinophils cells in this segment, and there are clumps or microabscesses of a clumping of more than four eosinophils in a group here. 
The spongiosis refers to intercellular edema. What that means is there is some swelling around the cells as evidenced by these white spaces here around the cells that just suggests inflammation. In some cases you can see degranulation, meaning that these eosinophils break apart and some of the microgranules inside the eosinophils will uh, spill apart. And then in some cases in certain biopsies, we will see that deeper layer um, kind of underneath this portion and we'll see some fibrosis or scarring. So oftentimes people will ask us, well, you know, how many biopsies are you going to take in our esophagus? And, you know, we did a study um, back in 2006 looking at this, and we found that the disease was very patchy, meaning that if only one biopsy was taken, we would only see the disease in 55% of cases, whereas if we increase the number of biopsies to 2, 3, 4, and 5, we would have 100% sensitivity, meaning a higher likelihood of being able to diagnose this condition. So based on this study, we've known now that this disease is very patchy and it's pretty routine to take multiple biopsies along the length of the esophagus in order to more accurately diagnose this condition. That brings up a question about, you know, are there non-invasive ways to test for eosinophilic esophagitis? Because we've talked about needing an endoscopy and a biopsy. And there have been some studies that have looked at various eosinophil byproducts in the blood, urine, and stool, although they're not very reliable. There's recent data, which you may have heard about in Dr. Furuta's webinar, about the esophageal string test. And it's a study spearheaded by Drs. Furuta and Ackerman. In. And what this is, is a string, a pill, with a string at the end of it, which patients swallow, and it goes down into the esophagus and into the stomach. And the idea is that this string rubs up against the lining of the esophagus and hopefully picks up some of the byproducts of the eosinophils. What the researchers can then do is evaluate that string for these byproducts and correlate it with esophageal biopsy. Now, this is not ready for clinical use yet, however, has some very encouraging data that suggests that, for instance, in patients who are going through um, surveillance or going through endoscopies after food reintroduction, it might be able to be used instead of an endoscopy. So there are some encouraging results there. So the things that we think about in terms of complications and outcomes in adults, this is a chronic and relapsing condition. There are persistent eosinophils in the tissue if left untreated. And that can result in strictures, or what we talk about as narrowing of the esophagus. That could lead to food impaction or food getting stuck in the esophagus that cannot be removed. And that happens in anywhere from 30 to 55%. Um, a small caliber esophagus, and what that means is that the entire length of the esophagus is more narrow than typical, and that can be seen in about 10%. In very rare cases, we can see perforation of the esophagus, either from someone trying to retch out food um, or after an esophageal dilation. Now, natural history studies, which have been done by Dr. Strauman, have shown that thankfully there's been no progression to malignancy or any generalized eosinophil disorder. There has been um, an impact on a quality of life due to stress over symptoms, uh, patients' fear of food impaction, and uh, stigma over diagnosis. Now, there has been a delay in diagnosis in adults with this condition. Um, hopefully, this is getting better with better you know, patient awareness, better um, physician awareness. But the one thing I want to mention is that patients, adult patients with EOE really do adjust and accommodate for their condition and their disease. This is chronic and relapsing, and we think of our EOE patients as professional eaters or rather professional chewers, meaning that patients have gotten very well, good at chewing carefully, avoiding certain foods, avoiding confounders such as alcohol because they don't want to eat too quickly. Some people avoid certain social situations like business lunches because they're afraid of food getting caught. 
And we've also heard that some people um, think that feeling the food getting stuck is just normal and they took too big of a bite. So I think overall, in general, with better kind of awareness, both from the physician and in the patient end, we're hopefully getting to a quicker diagnosis and quicker treatment for our patients. So what are the causes of eosinophilic esophagitis? And, you know, we don't have a lot of time here, so I mean, I will go through just a few things briefly, and that's the interplay with acid in the esophagus, and there is a very unique interplay with acid or reflux disease in the esophagus, and someone had um, asked a question about whether or not um, you can be diagnosed correctly without being on a PPI, and there's really an important role of using these acid reducers in the diagnosis of this condition. And oh, I'll refer you to a study here from Spain. And what these investigators did was that they took 35 adult patients with um, elevated eosinophils in the esophagus, and they treated them with an acid reducer twice a day. And they then repeated their biopsy, and they found that 75% of them improved. And so these are their eosinophil numbers, and you can see they went down. And 50% of the patients that improved had an EOE profile, meaning that they were allergic, they had characteristic endoscopic features of EOE. And what's really interesting is that 30% had a response with a normal pH study. So it suggests that, yes, these PBIs might be controlling the acid in the esophagus, but there may also be another component. And there's critical work out of Sue Speckler's group in Texas that suggests that there may be some anti-inflammatory properties of these medications on the esophagus. And we here at Northwestern have also seen that in patients who in all likelihood have endoscopic features of eosinophilic esophagitis, um, and a clinical history consistent with that in large numbers of eosinophils, 30 to 40% of them actually improve their symptoms, their endoscopic features, and their histology after a course of the acid reducer. So I do think this is a very important component in helping uh, to be on, um, in helping to diagnose this condition. Next, we talk about allergic conditions. There's definitely been a link to allergic conditions. Uh, many of our patients, 70 to 80%, will have um, what we call atopic conditions, such as asthma or allergic rhinitis, food allergies, atopic dermatitis, or eczema. There's been studies that have also linked um, mice studies that have shown that environmental uh, triggers can cause eosinophilic esophagitis in the mouse model. And we have seen some case reports where eosinophilic esophagitis um, activity can be increased potentially in high uh, pollen months. There's definitely been a link to food allergies, um, and we know that food antigens are typical triggers for EOE. And genetics now has been a big focus as um, a contributor. And the studies really looking at the genetic studies have been spearheaded from the Cincinnati group by Drs. Rothenberg and Blanchard who looked at this and looked at a gene profile in normal patients compared to patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. And what you can see here, although it doesn't list all the specific genes, is there is a grouping of genes in the EOE patients that are upregulated or multiplied and downregulated or decreased compared to normal patients. They found that one of the most upregulated regulated genes was eotaxin-3, and they also found very high levels of expression with a gene called TSLP. So I think these studies are very interesting and important in helping to identify um, and understand the pathogenesis or the mechanisms behind uh, this disease, and hopefully uh, sometime in the future may be um, some basis for some gene targets moving forward. So if I can put this together for you, um, this is a busy slide, but I'd like, you to, like to talk you through this. And this is how we um, 
think about the pathogenesis of eosinophilic esophagitis. And what we think about is that in a genetically susceptible person who may be allergic, meaning they have the asthma and the eczema and the food allergy, as food allergens come down into the esophagus, it triggers some inflammation and it causes the cells in the lining of the esophagus to multiply. And as these, and that's the epithelial hyperplasia, and as these cells multiply, they can um, cause recruitment of other inflammatory cells such as these Th2 inflammatory white blood cells. And all of this can trigger some other hormones that can cause, such as IL-5, that can cause these eosinophils to come out of the bone marrow and go into the blood and ultimately get to the esophageal lining. And those eosinophils can cause a significant amount of inflammation, and that in combination with this epithelial multiplication can cause some of those features like the rings and the furrows and the strictures that I was referring to earlier. So there are many points along this pathway that we are able to intervene on in terms of treatment. For instance, you know, elemental diet or dietary elimination, topical corticosteroids can help to reduce this inflammation, the PPIs or the reduction of acid here, which we've talked about, helping to treat other environmental allergies, which may decrease some of these other inflammatory cells, and some newer studies on biologic agents such as anti-IL-5, which are in the experimental stages. So that leads me to the portion um, talking about treatment options. And so I'd like to just focus on the most common treatment options that we um, typically use. There have been other medications that have been used in these diseases, but I'm going to focus here on the most frequent. So we talked a little bit about proton pump inhibition, and I think that's very important, at least in the early stages of this um, disease, in terms of helping to diagnose, and in some patients actually helping to decrease inflammation. Um, a standard dose can be just once a day, but it is a prescription dose equivalent to a meprazole 40 milligrams, and typically we will use that for about six weeks prior to repeating an endoscopy to see if that inflammation or the eosinophils are still present. And if they are still present at that point, then that is when we would say a patient has been diagnosed with eosinophilic esophagitis. So. Um, topical corticosteroids have long been the most common medication uh, used in adults with eosinophilic esophagitis, and there are three formulations that have been used in the literature, fluticasone, budesonide, and cyclosonide, and fluticasone and budesonide are the more common options. Now, fluticasone is given in an, in an inhaler form. Usually, the dosing is two puffs twice a day. Sometimes we have patients up to four puffs twice a day. And what we tell patients is to puff it into their mouth and swallow it down into their esophagus so that it coats the esophagus. After you use the inhaler, we ask patients to rinse and gargle out their mouth with water and spit out the water and not to eat or drink for an hour after use so that there is maximal contact time with the esophagus. Budesonide has been used in an oral viscous budesonide solution as well as an inhaled uh, and, and swallowed nebulizer solution, um, but it's typically used in the slurry form, meaning that the, um, the budesonide, one milligram twice a day, is mixed with five packets of Splenda to make a thicker solution, and that patients will drink, again, twice a day, same precautions, rinse, gargle out the mouth, and not to eat or drink for an hour after use. Systemic steroids, while they um, were used a while back before the topical corticosteroids were found to be so effective. We don't typically use systemic steroids anymore, but these are medications like prednisone. And there was a lovely study by Dr. Gupta in Indiana that looked at using systemic steroids versus topical steroids, and he found 
that there was no added benefit in using systemic steroids. Um, and so there were some added side effects. So therefore, um, there's really no added benefit in using systemic steroids and using topical corticosteroids is preferred. Now, there can be um, things that we have to caution patients about. For instance, uh, there can be a fungal infection called candida that can occur in the mouth or the esophagus in anywhere from 3 to 10% of cases um, due to the medication. And if that's seen, oftentimes this is asymptomatic, meaning that patients don't have symptoms, but sometimes the symptoms can come back, and that should alert us to the fact that this could be occurring. If that's the case, then we would... Um, need to uh, treat that with some antifungal medications. Um, the other thing is that in, there have been studies that have shown that the med these medications are very effective at controlling symptoms and at controlling inflammation. However, if we stop the medication, the inflammation symptoms will come back anywhere from weeks to months after discontinuation of the medication. So there is a movement to uh, being on a maintenance dosing of these medications, and ideally we like to try to decrease that number, um, decrease that dosing to the lowest dose possible that will help uh, keep the inflammation and the symptoms under control. Dietary therapy, like I mentioned, um, from back in 1999 with the first studies by Dr. Kelly, has been shown to be very effective in eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, studies from Kelly Leocouris and Dr. Kagawala looking at elemental or amino acid-based formula has been shown to be very effective at dropping the eosinophil numbers in the esophagus as well as controlling uh, symptoms. However, elemental diet can be challenging um, in terms of cost and, uh, you know, how it tastes. So therefore, Dr. Kagawala from Chicago looked at what's called a six-food elimination diet, and that was a diet eliminating uh, milk, wheat, soy, egg, nuts, and seafood, just to make it a little bit easier for patients to be able to do dietary elimination. And again, here you can see a nice reduction in the eosinophil numbers after this diet with a 74% histologic improvement, so really it worked quite well. So since these initial studies, there's really been three options for dietary therapy. That's elemental diet, or the total elimination of all food allergens with an elemental or amino acid-based formula. Typically, the adults that are on this diet will drink the formula, um, and sometimes we can supplement with apples or grapes or some other protein supplements, a targeted elimination diet, which is a diet guided by allergy testing, typically skin prick testing or patch testing, and this has been shown to be effective in children, however, not, um, a, not necessarily adults, and an empiric elimination diet, which is what I was referring to, uh, which was the removal of the six most common AOE food triggers, which is milk, wheat, soy, egg, nuts, and seafood. Now, um, previously, we used to think that these food allergies were really a trigger in children. However, it didn't make sense that adults had food allergies as part of their um, condition for eosinophilic esophagitis. However, we started a study several years ago, and it was published in Gastroenterology last June. And what we did here at Northwestern is we had uh, 50 of our adults undergo the six food elimination diet. So they eliminated milk, wheat, soy, egg, nuts, and seafood for six weeks, and then we repeated their endoscopy at that time. And we found that 78% of our patients had a greater than 50% drop in their eosinophil counts. 74% of our patients had eosinophil counts under 15, which again, remembers that diagnostic threshold. 70% had a count less than 10, and 64% percent had a count less than five. Now, if you remember, Dr. Kagawala's study showed that 74 percent of his kids had a count less than 10. So really, it's very equal and comparable to what's seen in the children. So it's working just as well in the adults. And what we showed here is that we then reintroduced um, the foods back into the patient's diet in order to um, 
better identify the actual food trigger for these patients. And what we found is that when we took the food triggers out, the eosinophils dropped. When we put the food triggers back, the eosinophils went back up to near baseline values. So really showing a cause and effect that foods really were triggering this disease in adults. The most common triggers that we found were wheat in 60%, milk in 50%, and soy and egg in 10%. And what was interesting is that our allergy testing was only predictive in 13% of cases. And since our study came out in June, uh, several other adult groups have shown um, if diet, effect of dietary elimination on their adult groups. For instance, Dr. Peterson in Utah has looked at an elemental formula in her adults and found that to be efficacious. Dr. Lucendo in Spain has looked at a diet eliminating more than just the eight foods, and eliminating um, additional foods on top of that and found a 74% response. So what we can find um, and conclude from all of this is that empiric dietary therapy is effective not only in children but also adults adults with EOE, and it's the first study to actually show that food allergens have been linked in adults, um, just like they have been in children. So I think that this um, disease is very similar in the two groups. A word about esophageal dilation, um, many adults uh, do have strictures or focal areas of narrowing in the esophagus. Um, what we do with an esophageal dilation is to use a device during the endoscopy to help stretch open the esophagus. And dilations work, but they will need to be repeated. What's important to note is that the dilation doesn't in and of itself alter the underlying inflammation, and therefore it's very important for people to be on a medical dietary therapy in addition to dilation, and it may cause significant disruption of the mucosa. So therefore, our teaching really is that if someone has a very critical stricture when, or narrowing when we do our endoscopy and they're having significant symptoms, then we would dilate and do a stretching of the esophagus at that time. However, if they don't have a critical narrowing, uh, we often will try medical or dietary therapy first before embarking on a dilation. And what's important to note and how we approach things is that really, um, you know, the question comes up with how do you choose the right treatment? Well, I really think that the treatment should be individualized. N one treatment is not the right for everybody, and it really should be based on patient's input as well as the available resources. So we have a very candid discussion with our patients about the options and about what's available in the literature, how um, effective these treatments are, and what it really entails to undergo med medical therapy versus dietary therapy. And, you know, patients have a lot of input with us in terms of what they feel is best suited for their lifestyle, and that's how, you know, we come up to come up with a decision and a treatment plan together. Uh, just a word about uh, quality of life. I mean, this is a chronic relapsing condition. And while we didn't think that quality of life in adults was affected as significantly as it has been in children, you know, we've done some recent studies in this area over the last several years and found that really there is a significant amount of stress over symptoms, um, particularly fear of food impactions or leaning up in the ER, um, fear of over the diagnosis and the stigma over the diagnosis, um, annoyances about avoiding certain so social situations to avoid these symptoms. So um, this is also a very active area of research. So what I'd like to conclude now to leave us some time at the end for questions is to just review um, what I briefly presented to you. Again, I can talk about this for hours and hours on end, which you probably don't want, but um, I went through a very brief, brief overview. And the epidemiology, it really is an emerging atopic entity. The pathogenesis involves food allergy, similar to that in children. Our typical clinical presentation that we see are difficulty swallowing and food impaction. Uh, diagnosis really requires an endoscopy with biopsy. Complications that we're concerned about include strictures, food impactions, and perforation. 
And the management of this condition um, really hinges upon either topical corticosteroids or an elimination diet, and that um, decision really should be individualized with a conversation with our patients. Again, um, I want to thank you all for your time and attention, and I'm here uh, for questions. So one of the questions is, are there, oops, okay, hold on. Um, I got to scroll back here. Again, bear with me, I'm not used to this. Um, I think what I read is, are there data trends indicating uh, changes in the EOE clinical presentation and symptoms in later adulthood? So we looked at this study when we compared our adult group and our uh, pediatric group, and we did find that as patients got older, they typically presented with the dysphagia and food impaction, and the younger patients really presented with nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and growth failure. We then looked at endoscopic features, and we found that those endoscopic features actually correlated nicely with age as well, meaning younger patients typically presented with more of the inflammatory pattern, meaning those white exudates and just swelling of the esophagus, whereas as patients got older, they were the ones that traditionally presented with the rings and the strictures. Now, we're not sure why that is. We suspect that and it might be that over time and in chronic inflammation, that's what it takes for this um, fibrosis or scarring to develop. However, studies by Dr. Shahade and Asavez um, in children have also shown fibrosis or scarring can occur in childhood as well. Okay. Is fibrosis reversible? I mean, and that is a great question. I th there have been studies that have shown that fibrosis can improve, and um, both from topical corticosteroids as well as dietary therapy. Um, that's been shown by Dr. Estevez, Dr. Shahade, as well as Dr. Lucendo in adults. So both adults and children can have um, reversal or improvement of their esophageal fibrosis, and we can also see that with patients who have been on these therapies for a longer period of time and have been on maintenance therapy, we've seen near, resol near resolution of their uh, endo endoscopic features. So it really does suggest that yes, indeed, it is reversible and important to keep um, on continuing treatment of this condition. So some people talk about um, the genetics of this condition, and there's a lot of concern that gets raised about um, passing this on to children. And I think while there is this interesting genetic link, and we have seen patients with family members, uh, children or parents, with this condition, I think that's very few. I think it's probably less than 10%, five to 10%. And the, we don't know exactly the genetic link, so I don't think at this point we can say, well, if you have EOE for certain, you know, your children are going to have that, I would say most likely your children will not get it. Um, there's no available genetic testing at this point for to answer that question. Um, while I do think it's a genetic link, I don't think the penetrance of that genetic um, link is something that um, we need to worry about at this time, but hopefully more research will help answer that question. So um, in terms of dosing of acid suppression, um, our, the diagnostic guidelines suggest using um, a therapeutic dose of the PPI, and what that means, they're dosing that would be equivalent to treating erosive esophagitis, and that would be the equivalent dosing of omeprazole 40 milligrams, and usually that's for a period of six weeks prior to your repeat endoscopy. At that point, the decision to continue that 
repeat acid reducer. Um, there are many factors that hinge upon that decision um, and would be made by the patient and the physician. If there was evidence of reflux disease, then absolutely this medication would be continued during this time. If any, um, there was a question about how long the anterior test or when the anterior test would be ready for clinical use. And um, if you've li listened to Dr. Furuda's uh, webinar recently, he really nicely outlines kind of the um, approach to research and how long it might take from um, a good idea to a study to when things are available. So um, it still is in the early stages of uh, of being evaluated. There have been some very, very encouraging uh, data so far, um, but it wouldn't, it's most likely not going to be available immediately for use. The question about natural history of eosinophilic esophagitis regarding its spreading to other organs, I mean, thankfully, the longest studies that we have have are from Dr. Strom in Switzerland, and there's been no progression of eosinophils to other organs or other, um, uh, other eosinophilic disorders. And there, a question comes up in terms of how frequently to be doing endoscopies on patients with um, eosinophilic esophagitis. And this is a really um, difficult question because there are no clear guidelines um, regarding this particular topic. What we typically, oh, thank you, um, Gillian, for making that bigger. Um, what we typically think about is after we do an intervention, for instance, after treatment with either topical corticosteroids or dietary therapy, or after adding foods back to see if the disease has recurred, an endoscopy with a biopsy is typically done at that time because there's a very poor correlation between histology and um, symptoms of the disease. However, in terms of just keeping an eye on things, um, we don't have a good answer for that. Usually, if patients have been on a maintenance regimen, either with dietary therapy or topical corticosteroids, um, I would recommend an endoscopy potentially in a year to make sure everything is stable and okay. And then after that, it would be based on uh, symptoms, although again, there's a lot of information, a lot of um, data and questions and research that need to be done to better um, answer that. So in terms of elemental formulas for adults, right now there's no specific elemental formula um, only for adults. I know the formula companies are very interested in helping to um, develop better options for adults. Um, in terms of uh, where that's going, I'm not sure, but there have been discussions with the formula companies about the need um, for adults. And I think in terms of coverage, that is a big challenging point. And we have, um, from the physician end, have written multiple letters to various insurance companies regarding getting coverage. And it can be done that way in, in addition to you know, patient assistance programs. Um, So in terms of um, one thing I wanted to mention about the dietary therapy, and there's a question about, you know, seeing a dietitian. I think if you are going to start on dietary therapy, I mean, one of the things that I want to advocate is that the role of dietary therapy is to not just keep people on the keep people off these six foods for forever. It's really to um, take away these six foods for six weeks and then reintroduce the foods with the goal of trying to figure out what your food allergy is. And then if you can figure out if it's just one food, hopefully, then the treatment plan moving forward would be eliminating that one particular food. I think it's very important before trying to do dietary therapy that patients see a dietitian. We 
use a dietitian and have an excellent one on our staff that works with our patients. Um, we provide them with patient education materials, sample menus, and we check in with their dietary logs within a couple weeks of starting dietary therapy, making sure nutritional analysis is complete. I mean, I think um, really having that as your resource, and that's what I mentioned in terms of individualizing treatment and available resources. I think that's one piece of the puzzle that's really important in terms of pursuing dietary therapy because it's hard when you think about, oh, I have to eliminate X, Y, and Z, but if you're able to see on a menu, okay, these are all the things I can have, it becomes much more um, realistic to be able to see if that can um, be incorporated into your lifestyle. It's hard to know about the natural history of children with EOE, and I'll defer that to some of the pediatricians who will likely be doing webinars later on, but um, for the most part, from studies done out of uh, Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, very few of the children actually grow out of their EOE. Um, and I do, so the thought is that these children will eventually grow up into adults with EOE, and therefore um, it is important if it's seen at a young age to continue treatment to make sure the kids are growing um, so that they can reach um, good nutritional status in adulthood. So in terms of how long before you eat after the topical corticosteroids, I mean, there there's no defined guidelines. We tell our patients an hour, um, 30 minutes is probably fine. My goal is just that they try to get the maximal amount of contact time with the esophagus as possible. So I suggest that people do it at night before they go to bed and then after breakfast so that they're not eating for that you know, hour or more. If there's a possibility that it's only half an hour, it's better than five minutes, but um, the longer, the better. Okay, let me scroll up to the top here in case I miss some things. The question about always um, having to be on a PPI, I mean, I, there, it, it is an important piece of the diagnostic component of this, and uh, most of us, if someone were to come to our clinic with just a diagnosis of eosinophils in the esophagus and they hadn't been on a PPI, we would place them on a PPI for six weeks and repeat their endoscopy. And if at that time the esophagus still had persistent eosinophils, that's time that we would tell patients that they've had that they have eosinophilic esophagitis so one thing about allergy testing and it's particularly important for adults is that there has been a very poor correlation with allergy testing particularly skin testing and the actual food triggers um, we saw this in our study it's um, been less than 13% predictive in our study, and there was another study from uh, Spain that looked at just allergy-directed diet and did not find a good um, improvement after just allergy-directed diet. And I think that is because, um, you know, those type of allergy tests are testing what's called an IgE-mediated reaction. And we're really not sure what type of reaction eosinophilic esophagitis is, but it's likely not an IgE-mediated reaction. So so this is a huge area of need in terms of helping to um, develop better allergy testing for adults because it would be much easier to be able to have a test that we can do and run and be able to tell patients that they are allergic to X, Y, and Z and then start eliminating that. But right now the empiric elimination or the six food elimination is typically what we do and it has been very effective. Um, we do caution patients that if we embark on dietary therapy, there will be additional endoscopies afterwards um, to help um, identify recurrence of the inflammation after the foods have been added, typically um, to what is done in pediatrics. So we've modeled our approach to what's long been done in pediatrics. 
In terms of inflammation in the intestines, we don't, we're not really talking about eosinophilic gastroenteritis as part of this topic. However, patients who have inflammation farther down, not just isolated to the esophagus um, and have eosinophilic gastroenteritis or enteritis, can definitely have stricturing or narrowing in their intestines as well. They can have ulcerations and inflammation, and that can often lead to low blood counts. But yes, it can occur um, typically with eosinophilic esophagitis, disease that is isolated to the esophagus. You do not see any involvement in the intestines um, after the esophagus. In terms of the idea of um, either the topical corticosteroids or elimination diet helping the inflammation of the esophagus, it does. It can help all the eosinophils. It can help the swelling. In certain cases, it can actually help open up some of that scar tissue or the strictures. In some cases, those strictures, if the scarring has been there for a long time, may not improve with either the topical corticosteroids or the diet. The inflammation will improve, meaning the eosinophils will improve. In the situation where that scarring or that stricture is still there and the other inflammatory cells are gone, if a patient is still having symptoms at that time, that's when a discussion about doing a dilation or stretching of the esophagus would be important because it suggests that we've done a good job at controlling the inflammation. However, that scar tissue or that speed bump in the esophagus is still a problem, and that's what would need to be um, addressed at that point. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night.